this panel is about uh, modeling lexicographic data. Um, so I'm going to give the um, each of the uh, paper the presentations. We only have four papers in this session, so we can give it like a, a you know two or three minute introduction to the paper. Um, I mean, I have some questions, and we'll take questions um, also from um, the audience. So um, I guess we can start. Carol, are you here presenting or? Yes, that's me, yeah. So yeah, my name is Carol Tiberius and I will briefly summarize the paper on the ongoing work on the Alexis data model. I believe that all my co-authors are present, so they will be able to take the difficult questions later. I think most of you are familiar with the Alexis project, uh, but just to be sure, Alexis is an Horizon 2020 project which will create a sustainable infrastructure for lexicography. And uh, here I would specifically like to focus on the Alexis platform for dictionary tools. Yes, this slide indeed. And as you can see here within um, Alexis, users will be able to convert, create, link, edit, enrich, and publish their data. We all know that existing lexicographic resources are quite diverse. And there's something which is uh, labeled as an example in one resource is not necessarily the same as an element labeled example in another resource. There's no semantic interoperability. And therefore we need a data model to indeed streamline the integration. Hold on, <laughs> that's still on the previous slide, John. <laughs> uh, to oh, streamline the integration. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to streamline the integration of um, data into the infrastructure to enable reliable linking to the, uh, of data in the dictionary matrix and uh, to provide a basic template for the creation of new lexicographic resources. And as a first step uh, towards this um, data model, we have started, that's the next slide, a common vocabulary. We have identified the core elements. And as you can see, it's not a very long list, um, but these are the main elements that uh, are considered relevant in the context of the Alexis infrastructure. Uh, then I'd just like to emphasize that, of course, Alexis is not alone in its need for standardization and harmonization. There are uh, related efforts, and they are discussed in the paper and also briefly in the presentation. Um, there's no time to go into that here, but I'm sure that will, might come up in the discussion. I'd just like to conclude here by mentioning the small survey that we did on the next slide. Um, Identifying, no, yeah, this one. Identifying and defining elements in lexicography has proven enormously difficult. And uh, we chose to evaluate our work by means of a short survey, which was sent to the lexicographic experts from the Alexis International Advisory Board and to the lexicographic partners in the project. Um, this was only a pilot. It was qualitative rather than quantitative. And then on the next slide, although it was small, it clearly showed the bottlenecks. And um, also, yeah, it showed what elements require more attention. In the near future, we intend to extend this survey and um, we look forward to discussing um, yeah, further today. So that was all. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so um, Avi, I guess, you're presenting this next paper? Yes, hello. Hi. I, I, uh, I also added a slide to, to have, yes, thank you. Uh, unlike uh, the other data models presented in, in this panel, uh, our data model is really application agnostic uh, to borrow um, Michal's words from, from his presentation that it's not intended to be a dictionary data model. It's, it's a data model for lexical data. And the dictionary is just one of possible applications for this. So uh, we're, we're not modeling a dictionary. We're modeling the data that underlies uh, the dictionary. That's uh, a crucial difference. Uh, also, our data model is not hierarchical. It's not uh, XML or JSON or something like that. It's a relational database. So it, it can have all kinds of uh, relations between the entities. And the point of our paper is that uh, we are 
we, we, we started out with the Eclex uh, data model by having uh, specialized entities for some of the multi word uh, uh, units uh, that are traditionally considered multi word units, uh, um, namely collocations, usage examples, definitions. Um, the rest we already listed in the same way as normal uh, headwords are listed. They, they are simply uh, headwords regardless of the number of spaces that they contain or regardless of the number of other uh, language units that they contain. But we uh, retained uh, especially collocations, which is the, the main point of this paper, uh, as specialized units because they seem to have uh, uh, specialized um, or, or uh, specific uh, data elements uh, pertaining to them. Uh, and therefore, it seemed um, uh, from the data model modeling point of view to keep them separate. Uh, this, in the course of uh, actually uh, putting the data in the database, has turned out to be um, a decision that we are not completely happy with. And uh, we are gradually moving in our thinking towards uh, the opinion that we want to have. Uh, uh, as few specialized entities as possible. We don't have, want to have a, a, an entity or a data structure for collocations. We want to list the collocation as a normal word and it will have relations to other words, uh, the collocates and the contexts and uh, any other data that, it, uh, that the collocation may need. Uh, of course, there is a trade-off between uh, uh, specificity or the, the ability to list uh, specific information and uh, universality, uh, but we are uh, gradually moving towards the opinion that uh, universality is, uh, is a better option. Now with question marks in the end, uh, we have usage examples and uh, this is motivated by uh, existing dictionaries where usage examples often are not complete sentences, but uh, phrases or idiomatic expressions or, or multi-word terms or collocations. So it's, it's often uh, very difficult to distinguish between uh, the actual linguistic content that is listed on, uh, on a usage example field, on a collocation field and on a headword field. Uh, also, uh, they all contain, they all can have uh, translations, they all can have definitions, uh, they all can have their own usage examples, so uh, their treatment uh, uh, is more or less similar. And especially question marked is definitions, uh, and this also is motivated by existing dictionaries where definitions often consist of a list of synonyms, which again makes uh, the, the def definition uh, field very similar to, uh, to a simple word field. Uh, also, in, uh, especially in uh, specialized dictionaries, uh, there may be uh, equivalent def definitions in multiple languages uh, or translations of definitions, uh, meaning again that the definition can have a, a foreign language equivalent. And uh, th these last two, especially definitions, are, are very doubtful. We, we're not likely to get uh, there anytime soon, uh, but, but uh, collocations we are working on, usage examples we are considering. And uh, the, the overall uh, direction is towards uh, something like a key value store, uh, for those who are familiar with those. Uh, we, we started out with uh, uh, rigorous discussions whether we should use uh, key value stores, triple stores, something like that. And people who had tried them, uh, people who had tried them uh, extensively, uh, recommended uh, to avoid it. And uh, we listened to them, and now we uh, are still moving in that direction. Not for all entities, but for entities that contain uh, word like uh, linguistic content. Okay, good that's all from me. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Okay, yeah, there's some good things with the discussion there. Um, okay, so uh, the last two papers are both by Michal, so 
Right. Hi, everyone. Here's me. <laughs> so my presentation is about uh, recursive embedding in dictionary schemas. Yeah, you can move on to the next slide, John. Yeah, it's just for illustration, really. Um, so recursive embedding is something you have in a dictionary if you have things like subsenses or subentries. And in my presentation, which you should totally watch, I, uh, I'm kind of describing and analyzing the different types of recursive embedding that people usually have in dictionaries. And the point I'm making is that having any kind of recursive embedding in a dictionary is a bad idea because it makes the dictionary more difficult to process by machines because you have these recursive structures, you have hierarchies that you need to crawl up and down and so on. So that's kind of the first part of my presentation. And the second part of my presentation is I'm making a few proposals how we could encode subsenses and subentries differently in dictionaries. By differently, I mean in ways which do not uh, depend on uh, sort of recursive embedding, recursion, or things that look like recursion, all right? So the suppose the gist of all my proposals is that we um, we sort of we, we encode these things as relations like we would have in a relational database so uh, we take the fact that a sense is a substance of another sense and we encode that fact as a relation between two senses and apart from that we just have a flat list of senses instead of a, instead of a hierarchical list and we do the same for entries and sub entries we just have a flat list of entries and then we have relations which tell us that this entry should be inserted into this other entry as a sub entry and the benefit of uh, sort of encoding dictionaries like that instead of how we used to do it until now is that we would end up with dictionaries which are more easily processable by machines it's easier for somebody to come in and write scripts and programs that process dictionary entries because there are only flat lists of things to iterate over instead of hierarchies to crawl through up and down right the the flip side is that the entries end up being a little less human legible so if you want to show entries to human users, entries that are encoded like this, then you need to reconstruct the hierarchy first and then show it to a human user. Okay, so it's a trade-off between human readability and machine readability. The argument that I'm making in my presentation mm -hmm. is that it's a trade-off which is worth it because we need more uh, we need more machine readability in how we encode dictionaries in lexicography in the future. So that's my uh, that's the gist of my presentation. You all totally need to watch it because there's a lot more detail in it. <laughs> okay. okay. And then I have another presentation. So here's me again, this time to talk about something slightly different. I want to talk about APIs. API is the abbreviation for application programming interface. And in the context of dictionaries, a dictionary API is a machine readable interface which a dictionary publisher can make available on the internet. And uh, an API is a place where a machine, not a human, but a machine can come in and read an online dictionary and obtain the entries in machine readable formats and do whatever the application wants to do with them. So an API, a dictionary API is a method for a dictionary publisher to make dictionaries available to third party software developers who can, uh, who are maybe building applications or tools where they want to integrate dictionary functionality as part of a larger application which they may be building, right? So I've noticed in the last couple of years that many dictionary publishers have started making APIs available. It's a hot new thing, you know, all the big players are doing it. Oxford University Press is doing it. K Dictionaries is doing it. Macmillan is doing it. They have been springing up right and left in recent years. So I thought that I should sort of uh, uh, present a kind of a summary of what I think has happened in dictionary APIs so far and maybe draw some early conclusions. So in my presentation, I'm taking you on a short guided tour of some of the APIs that I've surveyed for my presentation. Also, I'm asking myself the question, why are dictionary publishers suddenly, all of them making APIs available? What's happening, all right? <laughs> so you should all watch that presentation to understand what I think about these things. And then, at the end, I'm trying to kind of draw some common themes or conclusions or summar to summarize what's happening with dictionary APIs at the moment. And I suppose the most important conclusion is that it's too early to draw any conclusions yet because it's a relatively new trend. And it seems like all the dictionary publishers that have recently made APIs available are basically just experimenting with the, with the technology and uh, uh, just opening it up to see if there is any take up or not. 
And this would be a good point for me to say that uh, I suppose many people in the audience here today are maybe working for dictionary publishers who have themselves made APIs available in uh, recent years. And it would be interesting to hear from their point of view what their experience is, whether many third party software developers have signed up or not yet, what they're using their data for, or we don't know, and whether it looks like it's going to be another way for the dictionary publisher to generate revenue or maybe not. Okay, so it's a very early, very new trend. And uh, uh, let's see where it goes from here. So that's, that's me about dictionary APIs. Okay, thanks. So yeah, so it, it's a very um, interesting um, discussion. So I, I had sort of a, a few questions um, sort of prepared. So, um, and I see there's already some coming in uh, on the chat. Um, well, not lots of them is coming in on the chat. So I have to start. So one thing, and it sort of relates a bit to uh, Mikhail's second presentation and to Carol's presentation, is, is standardization is great, but I mean, there's also certainly an argument that you know, when we're talking about commercialization of dictionaries, that um, everyone having their own format can be commercially advantageous. And you see with all of these APIs where there's no standardization yet, basically you'd have to write a different um, thing to consume each of those different APIs. Um, so do you think there is, uh, you know, a contradiction between the need for standardization that is maybe in the academic world and perhaps more of a commercial um, desire to to be um, to lock users in almost? Well, uh, yes, of course, that's one thing that's one obvious conclusion to draw is that the, the APIs lack standardization. So each of them is a little different. I mean, they generally sort of obey the good practice that exists in online APIs generally. But beyond that, the, each of them is different, right? So the entry structures are different and the uh, uh, the structure of the requests and responses is different. I'd say there would be a not even just a not e not even just an academic case, but a business case for a bit more standardization here. Because if I'm a software developer who wants to build an application that somehow aggregates dictionary data from many different providers, then uh, you know I don't want to have to treat each API individually. And there is a common core of functionality which all the APIs seem to provide. So either we could um, sort of uh, persuade all the API publishers to adhere to a common standard or build some sort of an abstraction over the existing APIs, which would make it possible to, for somebody to query them at the same time. Uh, with just a single request. Uh, of course, you have not only technical obstacles, but also kind of administrative ones because you have to, each API requires you to sign up, create an account, you mm. obtain an API key, which you need to pass in with each request. Uh, each API provider organizes these things a little differently. Uh, some of the APIs you have to pay once you reach a certain uh, usage quota and so on, right? So, um, but the fact that we have these APIs, it's now become more obvious and more painful that we have so little standardization in lexicography and every, dic every dictionary uses a different structure. So it's very difficult to sort of aggregate data from different sources. Yeah, and no, I'm follow maybe with Carol, I mean, you know, do you, have you been looking then at how the Alexis data model could be applied in the context of JSON APIs? Want me to answer that? Yeah, I, I don't know. This is yeah. <laughs> well, I think that was, would be a question for Simon because I don't think I can answer that question. How? <laughs> would... I would say what Carol has been doing is a bit more abstract than that, right? So. Um... Uh, a good uh, inventory of concepts like definition, headword, and so on can be used to describe a dictionary regardless of whether it's encoded in JSON or XML or whatever. So that, that vocabulary is a, lit, is a little bit more abstract. Hmm. If I can say, as a, as a maybe as a question to Carol, I think what's not obvious in the vocabulary is whether each of those categories like headwords, definitions, sense, and so on, what it actually 
uh, refers to or what it's what it can contain right so some of these data categories are obviously like categories which contain a little piece of text right it's like a definition and then others are more like conglomerate of other of, of, of objects of other types like sense and entry and then you could have things that maybe are basically just pieces of text but they can also be modified by objects of other types like definitions can have labels and things like that so it would be great if the vocabulary was a bit more specific about this. So it, it would be great if the vocabulary was a bit more like a schema. <laughs> um, so that's kind of my... Uh... Well, I can only say, Michal, that that's really the next step that we first identified these um, core elements because we have an urgent need in the Alexifier tool to import data into the infrastructure. And for that, we need to know, yeah, we mean by a certain element name. And then the next step, yeah, if we want to use the same core elements to create our basic templates, for instance, for using uh, in Lexonomy, then we need to have a schema and define the relations that exist between these elements. So that's um, work for the very near future. And that will involve both of us. <laughs> <laughs> so and that was also one of the questions, I think, which um, was in the chat. So. Yeah, I'm afraid we can't comment on that any further. That's um, one of the next steps that we uh, plan to do is to, yeah, indeed um, create an abstract uh, UML model involving these core elements. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll maybe move on with, we can come back to, to this paper maybe. It is, it's plenty to discuss. And I go with the, the first question that was asked, which I think is by Michal's first paper. So um, Katrine is asking that the a tree is merely a special kind of graph. So, you know, why does it really make a difference how you write it down? Uh, well, the different, I mean, the answer is in the question, a tree is a, a tree is a special kind of a graph. And so when you limit yourself to a tree, there are certain things that are difficult to express, which would be easy to express in a graph. <laughs> so uh, I suppose that's a very abstract sounding answer, but uh, yeah, so yeah, I suppose you could say that one of the, th the, the, the thing that I'm trying to do with my proposal is to kind of introduce a bit more graphy kind of structures into what otherwise is a tree structure, right? So the tree structure is perfectly um, perfectly adequate for most of dictionary content, right? But then you have certain types of dictionary content like subsensing and subentrying and also cross-references and things like that, which are not very naturally accommodated in a tree structure. So for these, I think some sort of a graph structure or a relational database structure is a more natural fit. So that's what my proposal is. Mm -hmm. I, I, I still don't understand what problem you really want to solve because a, um, um, with one line of code, you convert, you convert your uh, XML structure into what you want. Um, I don't know, I, 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 quite, I don't understand uh, why you would like to have a flat structure and then translate it into relations. I don't even know how you would retain the uh, subsense order in your schema. Uh, so maybe uh, that is a detail you haven't looked into that. So uh, as a lexicographer, I, uh, I don't know why I would be bothered with uh, the fact that you want this another way. Okay, so those are, those are, those are three questions. So uh, <laughs> the first question is, people can disagree with me as to whether the inconvenience of having embedding and recursion is such a large inconvenience that it requires a redesign of the object model. I happen to think so. Maybe other IT people do not find it so inconvenient. So that's a question of opinion. The second question was, um, what was the second kind of sub question there? <laughs> uh, I wanted to know how you retain uh, the, uh, order. the order. Yes, uh, the order is preserved. Yeah, the, the, the proposal okay. that I'm making, uh, the order is uh, hard coded just as it would yeah so the, the order is preserved in my proposal so we're not using we're not losing any expressivity that's one of my 
important points. Yes, but what if I, if, as a lexicographer, I'm working and then I'm in an environment and I uh, change the order while yeah, I'm working? That would be the third I'm... question. If you're a lexic, the, the idea is that as a lexicographer, you would have a tool <clears throat> that uh, allows you to sort of uh, write dictionaries more or less the same way as you do now. Um, so as a lexicographer, you wouldn't have to sort of be exposed to how the dictionary is encoded internally, whether it's all just a tree or whether there are relations in there somewhere. Because my idea is that your dictionary writing system would kind of dynamically reconstruct and then deconstruct the hierarchy for you when you're editing the dictionary. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's all about convenience for people like me, for IT people, right? So for human users and also importantly for human editors, for the lexicographers, having a tree structure throughout is important. And that's, yes, you would still have that. But internally, some of the aspects of the tree structure would be decomposed and would be stored as relations rather than just tree, a tree structure because it's more convenient for certain kinds of automated processing. Now, on, on the other hand, maybe I think what is what is good about your proposal is it kind of uh, invites lexicographers to not, not to say just this is a substance, but what the relation is between the substance and the parent sense. Because it can be either a specialization, sometimes the substance is an exception of some kind. So it might be even a better uh, case for, for your proposal is to abolish substances altogether and to force lexicography, lexicographers to specify what kind of relation there is. Yeah, okay, so again, there are two things there. Yeah, you could go wild and you could say, okay, now that we have relations, we could annotate them with more kind of specific yeah. types of what kind of relation it is and so on. Yes, that's a, one way we could go. And another aspect there is that there seems to be a tendency in lexicography generally in recent years, not only in my proposal now, today, but generally the for kind of flatter structures so that we don't really have so many sub entries, for example, we kind of elevate everything to the level of top level entries, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's definitely a trend. And my proposal is taking it even further and saying we should do it not only because it's a good idea for, let's say, uh, from a usability point of view, but also because it makes the data structure more uh, simpler internally. So it's more kind of IT friendly. Okay, I might move this discussion on. I mean, I think it is, I, this is quite a controversial paper and um, I, I also have plenty of opinions on this that I've shared with Michal in other forums. And I see there's also a comment from Karen saying something very similar, but you know, recursion is a very natural part of programming, so why get rid of it? Um, but I think I'll move on this discussion and we, it's certainly something that can be discussed more. Um, and maybe move on to the, the next question, which is um, about the, um, also this is our uh, the domain model for the Alexis data model. I mean, is this a one size fit all thing or do you know, is there something specific for the this data model? Uh, within the Alexis, we're not, within the Alexis data model, we're not trying to cover everything that exists. So, because yeah, that's, um, well, there's been various efforts trying to do this, and that's very complex. So basically, what we try to achieve is semantic interoperability within this Lex1 platform for dictionary tools in the Alexis infrastructure. So that's capturing, I think, the, the common denominator between lexicographic resources and extracting information which is considered relevant uh, for achieving the Alexis goals. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So I see a few more questions about um, standardization relating to using sounds like TI. Um, I don't know, Arvi, did you have something to add um, from the point of view of the Equilex model on standardization? Uh, yes, uh, I wanted to point out that uh, the data model of the database is totally unrelated to the lexicographer's experience in the uh, user interface and also totally unrelated to what the API gives out. They, they are completely unrelated. Any kind of processing can go on between the database and the user interface. And, and this is uh, what, what we are doing. Uh, we, we keep them as, as totally different worlds. Uh, one, one is uh, intended to have an efficient data structure uh, the, the, the data model is intended to have an, an efficient data structure and, and it's not about uh, programmer convenience. We could always throw more programmers at the task if, if that was needed. But uh, it's, it's also about uh, 
avoiding errors, avoiding uh, potential error situations, avoiding repetition, avoiding um, duplication in, in this embedded thing, uh, what uh, Michal calls uh, recursive embedding. Uh, if you have actual subsenses written out inside the main sense, uh, that's okay for senses in a simple case like this. But suppose a subsense is uh, a subsense of multiple senses. The same subsense be belongs to more than one uh, main sense. In that case, writing it out would duplicate it. And, and that would be evil in, in the worst possible sense. Uh, and uh, avoiding these things is what we're considering uh, in the data model uh, part. The user interface, people in the chat are asking how about the user interface and, and the experience of the lexicographer. That's totally different. That's uh, a process of uh, reformatting, representing, re uh, whatever of the data so that the, the result will look the way the lexicographer wants. And if the lexicographer wants to see something else, then we can create another view for them. If, if there are if there is a different type of lexicographer, say a terminologist who, who wants to see a totally different view, a concept-based view, then we can create that on top of the same data. Uh, if somebody wants a table instead of uh, a search result list, we can create that. So, so these are totally unrelated. Also the API, uh, in my opinion, should be unrelated to what the database uh, contains or the, the database uh, structure and the, the API structure should be unrelated or at least can be unrelated. And this is also connected to uh, Michal's uh, uh, statement about uh, the dictionary publishers uh, have a problem with uh, application agnostic data that uh, I completely agree with. Uh, dictionary publishers have dictionary data, not lexical data. It's, it's formatted, it's, uh, it's presented in the form of a dictionary, not in the form of uh, application agnostic uh, lexical database. And uh, that is also a major problem in the standardization. We also publish an API and we have come across the situation that people ask us for an API. And uh, when we ask what kind of API, what kind of data and what for do you need? Then they can't answer. They, they simply want an API. What we have done, we have uh, exposed our internal API and uh, we have zero users. Nobody at all is using it uh, to answer your question about uptake. Um, and uh, I suspect the reason is that uh, people expect something different from the API, but they are unable to specify what exactly. So th there should be somebody, for instance, Alexis, uh, could uh, simply sit down and decide what is it that a dictionary API should contain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a very good point. You know, I mean, you know, having a separation of concerns here. And I wrote down a maybe more prov provocative version of this, which is in response to Michal's paper title of what programmers want. And my, my question was, why do we care what programmers want? You know, as lexicographers, you should focus on making lexicographers focus on making the data you know, accurate and linguistic and useful for the users and let the programmers figure out how best to, to implement this and how to, you know, work with the database. Um, Can I answer that? <laughs> yeah, go ahead then. <laughs> go ahead and respond. Obviously, apart from the fact that I'm so lazy, so I want uh, dictionary structures to be easy for me, um, I think that we're seeing a convergence of interests from uh, what lexico, what, what programmers want and what dictionary users want. And it's a convergence towards flatter, simpler structures. So I think that dictionaries are evolving from very deeply nested, uh, very, very large entries to a larger number of smaller, shallower entries so that every multi-word expression is a, has, is a, has an entry of its own, of its own and so on. And th this is seen as an improvement from the, user, from the user's point of view, right? So people can go to a dictionary website and search for multi-word expressions, for example, and they will find them as in independent entries and not as sub-entries hidden somewhere deeper in inside a bigger entry, right? 
And if we have sort of, if we refactor sub entries into individual entries, independent entries, then we can sort of share them, you know, so you can have a, an entry for black hole and it can be a sub entry on somewhere in the entry for black. And again, a sub entry somewhere in the entry for hole, right? So this, this type of thing would have been impossible on paper and it would, would have been impossible in sort of shallow digitized lexicography where we still have these deeply embedded uh, uh, rich tree structures. So I think it's not, so the proposals I'm making are not just what programmers want, it's what kind of is the trend in lexicography, it's it's what the users want, it's, it makes it kind of more clear what it is you're doing when you're kind of building a lexicographic resource, because you basically end up with a catalog of, uh, with a flat list of uh, linguistic expressions, some of them are single word things, some of them are multi word things, and sort of descriptions of them, right? And then optionally, you can link them together in a hierarchy of senses and subsenses, but that's kind of optional. So what I'm proposing is not just for programmers, it's, uh, it's not just for me, although obviously I'm motivated by mainly by the convenience for me as somebody who has to crunch dictionary data all the time and uh, process uh, XML and look at uh, dictionary schemas and read dictionary schemas. And I mean, dictionary schemas on serious dictionary projects tends to be so over complicated, right? If you've ever seen one or two or three, um, especially if you haven't written it yourself, you know that uh, DTDs and schemas on uh, sort of real world serious dictionary projects can be such ingrown monsters, right? And it's because of this uh, huge, huge variety of different types and subtypes and we have entries and then we have sub entries and then we have senses and sub senses and super senses and uh, uh, groups of senses and then we have run ons and I mean it's just so complex right so it's so difficult for somebody to have to look at maybe three four five different dictionaries and just uh, do write a script that somehow processes them or you know it's it, I, I think our our schemas generally are just uh, way too complex and uh, my mission is to simplify them. So this is another step in that direction. Let right, me add good. to that very, very shortly good. that uh, it's not really, I, I completely agree that it's not convenience of the programmer. It's uh, in some cases, the programmers who work on dictionary writing systems or, or model lexicographic data, they have experience modeling other kinds of data. They have uh, education in modeling data. And, and they simply know better than amateurs about how to model data. Can, can I respond as an expert? Yeah, no, no, sorry, hand raised. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, um, look, uh, I have ample experience in uh, dictionary writing systems, etc., and writing like uh, dictionaries, etc. And the support of a good IT is absolutely uh, necessary. But the way you present it and um, um, is um, um, is raising my hairs because uh, uh, what I think it what I think it should be and I uh, agree with uh, uh, with Arvi that what I think uh, we should uh, IT should offer lexicographers is a way uh, is ample support to make sure that they can describe their. Uh, entries or their data in the way they want it and give them as much support as possible to make sure that they can do that in a systematic way, etc., and that the data is represented as they would like to have it in their, uh, to, the, to their user. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are tendencies of simplification or not. That shouldn't be, uh, that shouldn't be, uh, um, uh, the the motor to promote this uh, way of looking at the work lexicographers do and how IT should su support it. It should be uh, what are the issues, where are the inconsistencies, is it in the description, is it the way uh, the data is presented, is it the way the data is made accessible, and then find a good a good way of supporting that and not saying oh you lexicographers we should uh, stimulate to do to do things more simple, and, and we are uh, adhering to this tendency to have it more simple. Maybe lexicographers do, are making things more simple because 
uh, uh, the way they used to be able to describe extensive analyses of dictionary content with, uh, uh, with all these nuances is not longer possible because uh, there's not an adequate IT support to do just that. So I would love for a next discussion to have a lexicographer, uh, the issues of the lexicographer involved in this and not uh, a programmer basically saying, oh, uh, uh, this is so difficult for me. <laughs> why, would I, uh, why would I like that? I will propose another model because uh, I, you know, that would make it more convincing for me. Mm -hmm. Maybe a quick response from Michal on that and then... Yes, maybe... I think you have totally misunderstood the tone and purpose of my proposal. I'm not proposing to change how lexicographers work. I'm, uh, as I've repeated a couple of times, we're not losing any expressivity in my proposal. We're still, we're, we are still able to say that this sense is a subsense of another sense. We're still able to say where it goes, in what order and so on, right? So. We're not trying to redefine what lexicographers do or how they do it. We're just trying to find a good way. We're just trying to make, make it easier for us as IT people to work for you as content people, right? So I think you have misunderstood what implications this proposal would have. It wouldn't, it wouldn't change how you work. It would change how we work. Okay. Yeah. I think it's, a, it's certainly a controversial paper. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll move on and talk because a few other questions in different directions. So Imogen was asking about um, how objects are related in the Alexis data model. Is there any idea of any restrictions or how we can how objects can be related using the from the elements of the model? I guess this is to Carol. Uh, that's future work. I can't say that yeah, much about that. I think I, I already said that, but. Um, I had a comment actually on um, the multi-word expressions and um, mm -hmm. the fact that, uh, yeah, you say people want them as separate entries, um, they want to be able to search for them. Uh, that I think uh, is definitely true. You want to be able to find a multi-word expression uh, when you're looking for a multi-word expression. Uh, we lost you, Carol. But um, I think also the presentations in the session. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, you broke up a bit there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I got a message. My internet is unstable. Maybe switch off the video. Right. Yeah. Okay, now I just wanted to say that, um, of course, we want to be able to, uh, yeah, to find these multi word expressions separately. But what came out of the survey as well, and what we have found more, is that um, it the session on Monday, is that it's important to be able to relate the multi-word expression to the source words or words that it goes with. Not only um, lexicographers want that, but also users, because it's easier for them than to relate this multi-word expression to the original. But that's just, it will be possible in your model because you just have to add a relation, but I just wanted to say that. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so we've got a few minutes left. So I, there's a question that I, I'm from Philip about the TC37 standardization efforts. So I understand they're still ongoing and, very, and fairly active. I don't know if anyone here is involved in it and wants to pipe up and say anything. That's the ISO, yeah, the ISO Technical Committee. Mm, yeah, I, I mean, I know it's still going on. I, I'm not sure who's exactly involved with it. I'm not involved in it. I don't think any of the other panelists are. I am involved in something called Lexidma, which is a yeah. Oasis uh, technical committee for designing an object model. So not an encoding standard, but a more abstract kind of an object model. And uh, um, I hope I'm not over interpreting what's happening inside Lexidma, but the principles of uh, redesigning some of the tree structure into relations is one of the design principles that the final Lexidma proposal or recommendation will be sort of, it will be in there, right? And again, I need to calm everybody down. This is just an internal IT thing, right? So you will still be able to see dictionaries as you see them now with sub entries and sub senses, and you will always know where they go. And uh, <laughs> so please don't panic. <laughs> yeah, and um, Wojtek also makes a similar point directed at me in my fairly um, <clears throat> con um, controversial way of uh, phrasing the question. Of, of course, you know, if you view the paper as something that's more directed at programmers and not at lexicographers, you know, things like 
third party tools are very important. Um, also, you know, we do need these papers to look at what's the best way to make things available through APIs and if these structures are better. Um, okay, good. Um, okay, lots more coming in. Um, but we've only got one minute left. So maybe this is a good point to um, close because we have to move on to the closing session, right? So um, I'll just say, you know, thank you to all the, the panelists. There's some interesting discussion. Um, I'm sure there's lots more. And, um, you know, obviously, Lex Sigma, as uh, Michal just mentioned, is a, a, an open forum through the Oasis thing where this can be discussed more and we're happy to take comments. So please, you know, most of the panelists are involved in Lex Sigma and myself as well. So, you know, we take comments through there and, and hopefully we'll, we're, we're very keen to hear from you. So I'd say thank you to everybody. And, and I guess we close this panel.